Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. I'm so excited to be speaking to my guest this week. And one of the reasons I started this show, started this podcast, is to try and put a spotlight on people in the fight game that perhaps don't do interviews, don't get asked to do interviews, but are playing a very important, pivotal role in how the industry is changing and evolving and progressing. My guest this week is Randall Anthony, who was the former director of UFC social media and since leaving has set up his own business, his new media agency, 333. Randy, so happy to have you on my show. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. So what I'd like to do just to start off with is kind of like jump into DeLorean. Let's go back in time, pre-UFC. I was actually looking at your, your <clears throat> LinkedIn profile and uh, God bless you. You've still got your five years of, of being a bartender <laughs> on there. Uh, you were a media relations intern at Extreme yeah. Couture. You were an anchor, weather reporter. Can you just share some insight into what your life was like pre-UFC as you were kind of just figuring out growing up, being a professional, getting into the workforce and what you wanted to do with your life. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you calling that out. Uh, <laughs> I haven't, uh, haven't updated LinkedIn in quite some time. I haven't posted in quite some time, so I need to get better at that. But yeah. Um, so I started uh, in the journalism space. That's what I wanted to do. I grew up loving the the Scott Van Pelt's, the, the, the you know, all the guys on SportsCenter. Um, and I wanted to be a journalist and a sports journalist at that. And um, so I was in school uh, at UNLV when I when I moved to Vegas in 2010, went to school at UNLV um, and was going through journalism and had to do an internship. And uh, I did my internship at Extreme Couture. Eric Nixick actually gave me my very first chance, you know, in the MMA space uh, in general, um, being an intern there. Uh, that's where I met, you know, the late, great Robert Follis. Uh, I met Randy Couture obviously Eric, Dennis, all the guys over at XC. And, uh, and while I was there, I was just exploring more with video and photo. Again, I, you know, when you do broadcast journalism, you have to kind of understand the ins and outs of editing, but it's not a, ne a necessity per se uh, to, to be, to be in that field. Um, so the more I did that, the more I kind of, uh, you know, liked it, kind of got to understand it more, got to do a little bit more interviews, a little bit more photography. And, um, and yeah, it really kind of kickstarted my my love for the media space and then also my love for MMA. I mean, I was a I was a big boxing fan. I liked MMA, but it wasn't like, you know, top of mind for me. Uh I had I had seen it just like everybody else did with, you know, the the first Ultimate Fighter and, you know, UFC 100 and all, all that kind of stuff. Um but yeah, I I started doing that more and more and uh ended up liking it. And the bartending <laughs> was just to get through school. You know, that's how I that's how I got through university here in in uh, in Vegas, bartending and working at the day clubs here in Vegas for for a little bit. So uh, yeah, maybe should take that off now. That, now that you mentioned it, but uh, it's part of who I am. So I kind of like leaving it up there. Well, I love it because I feel like bartending, that's where you must get a lot of social skills. You meet so many people from different walks of life, yeah. people coming through Vegas. You must have a few bartending stories. Yeah, probably not too many that uh, I can share or, or want to share publicly. But I mean, think about bartending in Las Vegas and think about what kind of story you would imagine you'd hear. That's probably it. It's probably along those lines. So, um, you know, a lot of craziness, uh, a lot of foot traffic, obviously, coming in and out of the city, um, even at that time and, and most definitely now. But um, yeah, it was a, it was an experience. And it, it, again, to your point, helped me kind of hone in on those on those skills of, of kind of just you know, cold meeting people, if you will, right? Introducing yourself, being able to strike up a conversation, making people feel comfortable, which is obviously a big part of bartending, but a big part of being in social, like you and I are, like you want to make people feel comfortable, even if there's a camera rolling, right? Because it's it, that's when you're going to get the best out of them. So yeah, I mean, in a, in a weird way, I'm, I'm sure bartending did help me kind of hone in those skills a little bit. Now you're in Vegas and obviously fight capital of the world mm -hmm. as an observer, as an outsider, before you joined the company, what was it like just seeing the UFC explode and just get popular and popular year on year in Vegas and, but also globally as well? Yeah, it was cool. Um, again, before I joined UFC, I was working at the Las Vegas review journal, which is the largest paper here in, 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 in uh, Nevada, excuse me. Um, and uh, I was actually covering stuff in Boulder City, which is like a, a small city right outside of, of Las Vegas and Henderson area. 
Um, and yeah, at that time, it, that's when it was really coming around. Rhonda, you know, was like the, the queen of everything at that time. Um, Anderson was still, you know, in his title reign. I think he, he had actually was about to fight Weidman for the first time. Um, Connor had just made his debut, I believe, or, or was just fighting in, in Ireland in his second fight. So it was really a lot of momentum going on in that sport. And, you know, from the outside looking in as a boxing fan, you know, there wasn't much going on. This was right after, I think, Mayweather Pacquiao around the time that I, I was uh, getting ready to join UFC. So boxing was kind of in like a lull period and MMA was just, especially UFC was just exploding. And, um, and I was like, man, that would be really cool to get my foot in the door because originally I wanted to use it as a stepping stone. I'm, I'm a basketball nut through and through, and I wanted to work in the NBA or, or, you know, do something along the lines of the NBA. And I was like, okay, I'll start a UFC because that's the only like major sport right in Vegas. The only team quote unquote that we had in Vegas at the time. And I'll just use it as a springboard to get myself into the NBA. So um, I started plotting and, and kind of going from there, trying to figure out how I was going to get into the company. And what was your level of, uh, experience when it comes to social media, whether it be personally, professionally, yeah. working for clients, where was your level of social media uh, competence, I guess, for lack of a better word, before joining the UFC? Yeah, no, that's the perfect word, competence, because, you know, I, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily all there. But but in fairness, in my opinion, I don't think many people were that competent in social at that time. This is 2013. So Instagram has been around for like two years, three years you know, Twitter's there, Facebook's there. Um, but everything was starting to kind of blossom at that time, right? In, in the 2013, 14, 15 area. So, uh, but my experience wasn't huge. You know, I kind of was, I, I kind of uh, learned intuitively about it. So when I was writing my my articles or my columns for the paper, I would notice if I'd tweet them or post them on Facebook with just the link and like a blurb about the the article, um, you know, it would get some traction, but not enough. Right. But if I took a photo of what that story was about, or I took a video of what that story was about and put it on Twitter and Facebook, I would notice the link clicks would be significantly higher. And again, at this time, on Instagram, there was no video yet. You could definitely not click links at that time uh, in Instagram. So I'm learning this through Twitter and Facebook and Again, I'm I'm in the journalism field, so my my captions, my copy are really long, right? Really specific at that time. Um, but I was I was learning, right? I'd look at the analytics, and say, okay, this this article did well because of, with, with this photo, uh, but this article didn't. But I didn't put a photo in it, so maybe there's something there. And was kind of just learning from there. So um, when I applied in 2000, uh, I think it was 2014, um, that was kind of the experience that I had. But I knew you know, what was working at that time. And I had been following, you know, UFC or NBA or, or, or any of these other leagues. So I kind of got an idea and a sense of like what exactly it is they were doing. So I wasn't, I wasn't completely blind, um, but I was a novice for sure. And you just said that you applied. So was this just an open application? There was a vacancy you saw and you applied and that's how you got your, your, your gig at the UFC? Pretty much. Actually, funny story. So I applied two other times for the UFC and got denied both times. And I applied for like a PR position um, with, uh, and I had interviewed with Dave Schaller, who was the, the head of PR at the time there. And then I applied for a corporate comms uh, position uh, as well. And one of them, I didn't even get a call back. The other one, I had like two interviews and I was feeling confident and then didn't get the job. So when I saw the social thing, I was like, man, these people got to be sick of me. Like I, I already, I've already applied, you know, two times. Um they, they, you know, they're probably tired of seeing my name. So I was actually in class um, with a with a, a woman who had just graduated the semester prior and was working at UFC in the PR department. And she called me and said, "Hey, um, there's this social media position open. I think you'd be, you know, really good at it." And I was like, "Nah, like I don't, I don't want to do social media for like a career. It's not, you know, I do it with my articles and stuff. It's kind of fun, but like I don't think there's a there's a real career to be had there." She was like, trust me, just apply. You know, I think you'd be great. So after a little bit, I did. And I had an interview with Shanda. I don't know if you remember Shanda, the former director. Legend. Of social Legend, bro. The best person, the best person ever. She she was so instrumental to me and to a number of people in the social space currently, present day. Um, but yeah, so I interviewed with Shanda and uh, and I got hired after one interview, like on the spot. And I was like, okay, well, here we go. I guess we're doing this now. So. Man. 
that's huge because then you're in and you're in the machine, you're in the promotion yeah. at a time when like like we've already spoken about, mm-hmm. the company is just getting bigger and bigger, doing more events, bl- blowing up internationally. What are some of your the earliest memories, the first couple of months working mm-hmm. for the UFC? Are you hitting the road? Are you part of the traveling circus? And, and also on the social side, kind of getting involved with the fight game, promoting events, promoting fighters, promo- you know, promoting PR yeah. and news and, and all that good stuff. Yeah, that was the biggest like holy crap moment for me is like, man, this there's so like this whole the way this whole thing works comes through this vessel right here called social media. Like all this, the media, the 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 interviews, all that stuff is great, but everything flows into this, you know, this this tunnel, as you know, everything comes through social. And that was something that I wasn't really I didn't grasp how large it was at that time and how much, you know, stuff comes through social, but yeah, my, my first event was Aldo McGregor. So no way. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, you know, first event, boom, like the biggest, the biggest event you could, you could do, um, at that time. And then the next week, um, I think was Orlando RDA and cowboy two. I didn't travel to that one. And then my next event was Condit Lawler, which was like another one of the greatest fights ever. So I had I was spoiled right off the bat with like two of the biggest or or best events, you know, um that you can think of. Uh and then I didn't tra- I traveled I I think I started in like November, December and my first event traveling was in February. It was Pittsburgh. It was uh Luke Rockle David Branch, I think. Or, or no, no, it was um Man, I don't know. Oh, Cowboy versus Cowboy. Oliveira versus um Cowboy Cerrone, I think. Was my first event on the road in Pittsburgh. Um, but yeah, once, once, and, and once, which I found out, once you accept that, yeah, I'll go on the road, it just starts going like there's no, and at that time there wasn't a team like there is now. Now they have, you know, 10, 12, 13, 14 people just in the U S office at that time. It was, you know, four of us and Shanda, which Shanda was, you know, higher up. So she's not traveling like that at that time. So it was, uh, it was definitely different. It was definitely a different experience and, and, but it was good. You know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in kind of like that trial by fire type of mentality where you just kind of get thrown in and figure it out with just a little bit of guidance. And um, so I think that actually helped me quite a bit. Yeah. What a baptism of fire, especially (laughs) some of those first massive events. I mean, a Conor McGregor event as your first major event is insane. Uh, As someone that's kind of been based in Vegas, you know, prior to joining the UFC for the most part, what was it like transitioning to being on the road so much, being in different time zones in different continents and different countries, and also at the same time, making sure that the output on social media and doing your job to the best of your ability? Yeah, it was eye-opening to say the least. So a little bit of a backstory, not to go too deep, but I'm I'm from South Mississippi. So like as, as podunk, as rural, as like small town and small minded as you could possibly imagine, right? It's like the deepest of the deep South. Um, you know, love it, love where I grew up, love a lot of the people. I'm still close with them today, but it's not, you know, th- their their idea of a vacation is like Tennessee, which is the next state up, or Texas, which is like two states over. You know what I mean? They don't they don't really get out of that Mason Dixon line area, right? The Bible Belt. So for me, you know, I had always wanted to travel, but I was kind of scared. I'm like, why don't we start with like Mexico first? You know, like it's right here. Like I could just, you know. Uh, my first international trip was Brisbane, Australia. So they just, you know, sent me over. I forget. I think it was uh, Mark Hunt and Frank Mir um, in that in that main event. And uh, and that was it. And once that started, you know, it was a lot. I think a lot of people, you know, they they see, man, you're in your 20s. At that time, I'm 20, you know, four or 25. You're traveling the world. You're doing like you're working for this awesome company, this and that. And all that is great. But you still have a job to do at the end of the day. So you're not, you know, you're not exploring the country like you would if you're on vacation. And number two, I don't think people understand how physically taxing and draining it is to do those type of shows back to back to back, sometimes two or three weeks on the road straight. Um, so it was a lot, you know, it was a lot. It was a lot of leaning on on people in different regions, whether it was like someone from that's based in Europe or someone based in Brazil because they're maybe in a better time zone and and you know what I mean, or someone back in the US office. So um there was a lot of teamwork, a lot of communication. You know, it's not always perfect, right? Stuff falls through the cracks, but um you have to lean on on your teammates at that time because it's just it's it's impossible to be 12 hours ahead and try to keep a cadence for a certain time zone or 
meet a certain deadline or, you know, jump on a call. Like it's just some of those things are impossible to do. So it was, it was eye opening. Spent four years there and year on year, you're getting a promotion. You're getting a promotion and all the way up to being the director of social media for the UFC. Did mm-hmm. you did you think that the the career path would progress so quickly? Mm-hmm. And and how did you actually kind of work your way up to that director level in terms of the team, the output, the ideas, the strategies? What were you doing for the UFC that you felt as though was so pivotal in helping you progress in your career? Yeah, so... You know, some of it was, you know, I I, I want to say being, you know, um, uh, smart with with my approach and things I was doing and different uh, ideas I was bringing to the table. But as with anything in life, to to progress to a certain level or, or go to a certain um, destination, there's a little bit of luck involved, right? A little bit of fortunate or unfortunate events. And in this case, <clears throat> it was an unfortunate event. You know, Endeavor bought UFC. Um, six months into my tenure, nah, maybe eight months into my tenure at, at UFC. And again, at that time, there was a group of, I think, four people at the US office. So, you know, they got rid of basically got rid of or people left on the team um, at that time. And the only ones left were myself and Gavin, uh, who was also a director of social for, for a period of time. Uh, but he had left to go move to Singapore to open the UFC Asia office. So I went from coordinator with six months experience on the job and a team to nobody and just me. And at that time, again, trial by fire, right? You just have to figure it out. And after six months, I'm in meetings with, with, you know, Dana and and Craig Bersari and Lawrence and all these, all these executives who are at the highest level of their jobs and their careers. And I'm sitting here like 25 social coordinator, like, man, why, you know, I, I better figure it out, right? You got to figure it out fast. So um, I think, you know, part of the reason I was able to progress so quickly and move up uh, the ranks quickly was because I was able to figure that out, right? I was able to kind of just maintain the ship until we were able to get some some resources in. And, you know, we brought in one person, I think uh, maybe six or eight months later, some, something around there, then another uh, high level person in, you know, a couple months after that. And uh, slowly began to kind of rebuild um, from what we had, but um, you know, again, I think a little bit, you know, a little bit had to do with me and 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 kind of my prowess and and figuring out what I needed to do, and, and a little bit was a little bit of luck, but it was unfortunate luck, right? You never want to see anybody, you know, go out that way, or you don't want to. At least for me, I don't want to get anything in that way. You know what I mean? I want to earn it, and so I feel like I did earn it, but it was also a little bit of of you know timing. Absolutely. During your time with the UFC, were there any events or any activations or any launches that you were hands-on involved with that you are very proud of in terms of what you left behind during your time there? Yeah, there's a few, man. Um, I think the whole UFC 25 year campaign um, was was really cool. Um, you know, the creative team done a, did a great job in kind of figuring all of that out and, and, and putting that all together. But we were able to do some really cool activations. Um, with a number of partners, we built this huge like UFC 25 glove wall. It was like this big, you know, 15 foot by 20 foot like silver wall with all these UFC gloves and did a lot of cool activations around that uh, throughout that whole year. Um, Mayweather McGregor was, you know, probably the one of the biggest events, probably one of the biggest events I've ever worked. Um, and, you know, UFC didn't have a lot of people on the ground there. So I think it was me and one other guy capturing content that whole week. Um, and we, we had activations going on. We, we built like a boxing ring. We worked with a partner and built, built like a boxing ring and had, you know, Irish flag, American flag, and had, had all kinds of celebrities and influencers come in and, and we're kind of doing different things there. Um, and then, yeah, I was, you know, I was a part of the team when, when the UFC were establishing all of these partnership deals with, with the platform. So, you know, having like a, a content, um, agreement with meta or with Facebook at the time to, uh, you know, put long form content exclusively on Facebook, uh, doing the Snapchat deal, which if you go on snap now, you'll see like two UFC shows, they might have more now, but at the time we did a deal for, you know, two weekly Snapchat shows, which were, you know, really big revenue drivers for the company. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say that during my last year there, last year there, 
we made uh, the social media department a revenue generating department for the first time, you know, in the history of the company. So there was just a number of cool activations that we did, you know, a lot of great business uh, things that we did as well. So uh, yeah, I, I look back on my time there pretty fondly. It was a, it was a cool, cool experience and a whirlwind four years. Absolutely. And so obviously you mentioned Dana Wyatt and that obviously when you, when you're in the machine and you're in the UFC, you have Dana and all these incredible executives from different walks of life, very, you know, powerful businessmen. Mm -hmm. Were you able to learn from just being around them? And, and what was that experience like for you? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't around them as much as I was maybe the last year I was there. Cause that's when I was, you know, worked my way up to the director level was in a lot more of the, you know, executive meetings and things like that. But yeah, I mean, you can, I mean, if, if no matter what you think about Dana White or any, any, you know, high level executive on, of any company, um, you'd be crazy to think you can't learn something from them, right? They're in the position they're in for a reason. So yeah, I mean, a lot of it for me, um, you know, I, I'm the, I'm usually the quiet guy in the room and I love to kind of just observe. And so just observing the way, you know, maybe they communicate, uh, the way they think about, you know, offering certain things, the way they approach a business deal. Um, you know, there's a number of things that, that I can look back on and say, you know, that was pretty slick or that was something I want to take. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's one thing being a fan. Uh, mm -hmm. of the sport, of, of any combat sport. It's another thing when you're kind of working in the industry and working in the fight game. Did you did did you ever get jaded? Did you ever, you know, there's a term at the moment going around a lot and I've certainly used it and experienced it. You know, when you start to see how the sausage is made, it perhaps changes your perception of yeah. the actual sport. Was there any moments like that that you felt, oh, you know, this isn't exactly, you know, what I thought it would be or maybe does your fandom decrease and is it just a job at the end of the day for you? Yeah, I mean, you you, you know, everyone is human. It is, it's only human to feel that. And, you know, specifically with UFC, and I, I've talked about this a number of times before, and so have other people at that time, specifically, you know, I keep bringing up the size of the team, but it's really important to understand, you know, there was a year where I think it was that, that year Endeavor bought UFC and then the, the following year from there, I mean, I was on the road probably 32 weeks out of 52 right and and that's ufc does what 42 events in 52 weeks um you know you're just you're you're running on e and again it's super cool to travel the world and it's amazing to be there with your colleagues and and it's really cool to to get that experience but you're only human you're going to you're going to run out of gas at some point and then you know you get contender series introduced and then ultimate fighter comes back and then you're just like working all of these different events and you're just like, man, this is a, uh, this is a lot, you know? And, and again, it, you, you, you know, anyone who says they didn't is lying in any job, not just UFC in any job. Right. And, and I'm sure you feel that. And anyone who works in social specifically probably feels that you just kind of get a little bit fatigued. Um, for me, it didn't dwindle how much I enjoy the sport, but it did dwindle my, um, my outlook on, on, you know, the position I was in, right? Like it, it, I, there, there was a moment where I wasn't taking a step back and saying, man, people would love to be in this position. It was just like, man, F this position. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's just too much going on and like, you know, there's not enough, uh, there's not enough help and, and, uh, and it just, it's just a grind, you know, it just what it is. Um, and that's not a bash on them or, or any other league, but, uh, it's just a grind. And so, yeah, you definitely feel that that fatigue and that kind of, you just get tired uh, of doing yeah. the, doing the job, you know, so many times in a row. What ultimately led to you and the UFC parting ways? It's a good question. Um, you know, I think that I, I, I'm someone who is very vocal when it comes to stuff I really believe in. Right. And in my opinion, there was a there was a specific way to continue to do things the way we were doing, and the data backed that up. Right at that point, I or we had just passed the NFL and like Instagram followers, and that was like a that was like a big deal for for Dana and and it was in the media and stuff. And our numbers were were climbing again. We had just did like two separate you know seven figure deals with two different platform companies in social alone, and um and you know it's just. They're, they're, it's not my company. So I'm going to lose this battle 10 out of 10 times, but I'm going to fight for it because I know at that time, the guys that I was working with felt the way I did. And so, 
um, you know, I just was very vocal about how I felt we we could continue to go and, and the type of stuff that we were making and, and um, you know, this type of stuff I wanted to, to put out on a, on a prestigious platform like that, because it is like that is very valuable and prestigious real estate at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, it just it is what it is like it, it wasn't received as well. And, and um, you know, that was that. So, it, it, you know, can't can't win them all, especially when it's not your company. So. When did you have the idea to start your own business and and set up your own agency? And was that the first idea that came to mind post UFC, or were you maybe thinking, okay, maybe I can go to another promotion or another league? Because you know, having director of social media for the UFC on your resume is pretty damn good. You can yeah. pretty much that that will open a lot of doors for you. So why did you decide to maybe go the personal entrepreneurship route and start your own business instead? Yeah. So it wasn't the first idea, actually. I, so let me back up. I had always, and I think part of the reason why, you know, I, I butted heads or, or you know, we, we parted ways at the end was I'd always been on the athlete's side when it came to certain things, right? And, and things that are just very baseline. This is not even about like money at this point. It's just like very basic like things. So I had always been on that side. And then at that time too, um, and maybe some of the athletes will remember this. We had started printing out their social analytics for like the last six months when they were heading into a fight. And we'd say, okay, here's all the platforms you're on. Here's your numbers. Here's your numbers. When you fight, you could be doing X, Y, and Z more. And some athletes were just like, I don't really care. And some athletes would literally sit with me for like four, cause we did it with everybody on the card, all 26 athletes or whatever it would be from top to bottom. And again, some would, some would enjoy it. Some wouldn't. Right. But I had always had that, like, you guys are the stars here. Like, you guys need to keep doing what you're doing, especially during the, this five-day stretch, because every every eyeball is on you, right? So anyway, um, no, when I left UFC, I went into esports, which I'm not a gamer, but I know esports is like this, you know, blossoming market, right? So I, I was the I was the head of content for the arena here in Vegas, the HyperX Arena. And I did that for like six months and I just couldn't do it. Like I couldn't even fake do it. You know what I mean? I just wasn't about the the gaming industry. And during that time, um, I was also doing some, or I'm sorry, let me, let me go back. During that time, um, I was still te texting with athletes. People would hit me up for, um, you know, ideas or questions to get verified on Instagram. And I'm like, guys, I'm not, I'm not there anymore. Like I, this isn't, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, Fast forward, I go to dinner with Francis one night and um, we're, we're over having dinner, just kind of talking. And uh, he was someone that I, I had always kind of like had his back in a way. Like I'd always get him his content from fights or I'd always kind of talk because he was always inquisitive. Like he wanted to know about everything right he, from from day one, even when he couldn't speak English, he would he would ask through a translator about like, you know, X, Y and Z. So we went to dinner. And, um, you know, we talked about doing content together and, 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 you know, what, what I think could help him and, and this, that, and the third. And after that dinner, and, and after we kind of started working together for a little bit, I was like, man, like th this is basically what I've been preaching for the last however many years for athletes to, you know, own their own content, own some IP, own something that's going to benefit you well after your career is done, you know, because, and not just UFC, any sport, NBA and NFL, they don't own anything, right? They don't own anything. So um, that's kind of when I had the idea to do that. And, and, and so I started the business. I was working with, with Francis uh, and I was doing some consulting on the side. And that was in a bunch of different sports. I did, you know, action sports and rally cross and, and skateboarding and all kind of all kind of stuff. So, but yeah, that, the, the original plan was not to start a business. It was to continue to to work in the sports space. And then that dinner kind of changed everything. That's incredible. Number one, <laughs> I can attest to what you just said about Francis, because there were a few events that I covered as a member of the media. And he'd always come up to us afterwards and be like, hey, what lens is that? What camera mm -hmm. is that? He's always mm -hmm. very curious about the, the kit that we were mm -hmm. using and how we were shooting and what we were using for photography and things of that nature. But man, you don't have that dinner with Francis and you're not starting this business. That's how pivotal that moment is in your life. I think so, man. I think, I mean, again, you know, anything could happen, right? I could think about it six months from then, or I could never think about it. So yeah, I mean, that, that moment when we're talking and we're, we're having this dinner, 
um, that's what that's when it clicked. So yeah, without him, this this kind of doesn't start, you know, happening. So yeah, pretty pretty crazy. So early 2020, you launched 333. If you could explain to the viewers and the listeners what that company uh, title means. Yeah. Well, what the title means. Yeah. So the title, the title is 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 interesting. Um, so in digital marketing, digital social space, um, timing is everything, right? So 333, three seconds. The the first three represents three seconds, which is the amount of time you have to capture the user's attention, right? The next three, which is 30 technically, um, is the amount of time that a user will spend on any piece of long form content when you know you have their engagement, right? So that's like maybe something that's a little bit longer than a than a than a short TikTok clip or or whatever. A YouTube video, right? Something like that. And then three, the final three, which is three minutes, is the amount of time it is the amount of time that people spend on your website or any piece of branded content, they're more likely to buy if they hit that three minute mark. So when I was kind of breaking it all down, it was three thirty and three, which is three thirty three. Perfect. Easy. <laughs> So yeah. you start working with Francis and I mean, my God, what an incredible run, you know, now correct me if I'm wrong, this is pre him winning UFC heavyweight championship. Yeah. So the first fight we worked together was Jarzinho, right. I think. Yeah. Okay. So it's separate from the UFC, right? So obviously yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Was, was Jarzinho. Yeah. Cause I think he fought blades the second time and then I left, uh, UFC the next month. So then Jarzinho was the next fight. Uh, was that weird uh, for you to now be with the, with the athlete, with the fighter, but at Very. a UFC event, picking Very. up a credential, right? So actually, funny enough, that was, I wasn't there at that fight because that was peak COVID okay. and in Jacksonville. And they were being super strict on the amount, uh, especially him not being in a main event or a title fight very strict on the amount of cornermen and, and people that he could have in his camp and number of rooms and X, Y, and Z. So I was working with him that whole camp. And then, you know, Markel, Eric, and Dewey went down with him um, to Jacksonville. So the what you're talking about, though, is the Stipe fight, the actual title fight, was the first time I was back. And I was on the other side and getting it. Yeah, it was very weird. But it's like, like, it is what it is. You know, like, I don't think people care internally as much as I thought they did. And I didn't care as much as maybe they thought I did. You know what I mean? Like you, you find, you figure out over time, like nobody really cares as much as maybe you think right on, on certain things like that. So, uh, yeah, it, but it was definitely weird. Like it was definitely weird being on the other side. What has it been like for you to be working with Francis who has been arguably the number one news story of, over the last couple of years, baddest man on the planet, heavyweight champion, free agent, because what you're helping him with, with regards to social media is, like you said earlier on, it's everything. It's media, mm -hmm. it's PR, it's reacting to something that's out there, a quote, an interview by, and strategizing with him. And, you know, it's not as if you're working with, you know, a prelim fighter on his way up. This is one of the biggest names in mm -hmm. the sport as your, what, I guess your first client for your company. Mm -hmm. what, what was that journey like with you and Francis, especially during this time of his career? Yeah, it was interesting. You know, it was interesting. It was a lot of figuring out each other, right? Like I had known Francis since his debut in Orlando, right? But when you work for UFC and they're the athlete, there's just like any relationship, there's a working relationship and that's where it ends, right? Um, so you got to figure out, you know, everything about that person, what what they like, what they don't like, uh, how they like to be kind of spoken to. And I don't mean like, in a in a bad way or anything just like do you prefer text do you prefer call do you prefer slang do you you know what i mean like and and he's speaking his third language when he's talking to me right so it's there's a little bit of a communication um barrier and stuff but uh you know it was just trying to figure out the best way to make this a cohesive um effort and you know shout out to markel who who was instrumental in making this arrangement even happen because after dinner the three of us went to uh, a coffee shop and kind of like basically did the paperwork and, and signed it there. He was instrumental in helping me understand, you know, communicating with him. Cause he had worked with him for like two fights prior. So he had been there a little bit longer exclusively with Francis. Um, so, you know, he was helping me figure out here's how to communicate with them. Here's what he likes. 
you know, this, that, and the third. Uh, and then same with Eric as well. And, and, and you know, being, being like a big brother and, and helping me kind of navigate, Hey, here's when he's going to be here. Maybe he didn't respond to you about this training session, but he's going to be here at this time and, you know, bring this cause we're going to do this. And so there's just a number of things to figure out and, and, and to navigate, but um, you know, the communication part is the biggest part as in any relationship, personal or professional, it's just about communicating and figuring out, you know, what makes the other tick, what they like, what they don't like, et cetera. And again, like we both said, Francis is very hands-on when it comes to the content. You know, he wants to know the camera. He wants to know what the purpose is, why you think it's going to do well, uh, you know, all of that stuff. So he's a, he's a good communicator in that regard. Sorry. No, no worries. I would say that Francis is arguably your evidence kit. If you had to say, oh, had a, had a pitch meeting in terms of trying to get a new client, all you need to do mm-hmm. is kind of point to Francis. If you had to say to someone what you've achieved, with Francis in terms of a professional capacity with his social, what would you mm-hmm. say that is? I mean, I don't know, man, this, I'm not a, you know, I don't ever get on uh, and do media. I don't ever talk in front of the camera. That's not my job, right? My job is behind the scenes, but I would say this, I would say Francis in his last three years at the company fought two times. And in those three years, he had some of the biggest growth across all of his channels out of everyone on the UFC roster and even some other athletes in the NFL, NBA, you know, NHL, uh, all that stuff. Right. And that's because he understands the value of owning content and being active and engaging with his audience. So, you know, I figured that that could speak for itself. Right. I don't think I need to say anything in particular, or any kind of crowning achievement, excuse me. Um, but fighting two times in three years uh, and still having that kind of growth. And and as you said, being everywhere, even in those times when he's not active, um, I think speaks to, to, you know, the kind of content that, you know, he was turning out and, 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 and um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's a credit to you and Francis and the team because you guys were consistent on his accounts and you could see the growth happening. And it's not even just Francis only fighting twice in that period of time. Most fighters only fight a couple of times in, in a 12 month period. And it's how do they stay consistent and how do they you know, grow their accounts and ultimately get it monetized and have activations with sponsors. Obviously Francis isn't the only client you've worked with since mm-hmm. you launched your business. So can you actually speak to some of the other clients, some of the other fighters and brands and promotions mm-hmm. that you have worked with over the last couple of years? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, again, this this 333 has been evolving every month, right? It started as, hey, let me let let us help you grow your social channels and let's we're going to be this premier brand management, you know, company. Um, but then from social channels, you obviously create content. And so then you create content and you create longer form content and then you branch into different avenues. So, um, yeah, so I mean, I I worked with a, a number of of athletes. I worked with um, Kamara Usman for a couple camps, uh, the second Masvidal fight. And I, I think the second Colby fight, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, I filled in for, um, uh, a fight week with Izzy one time when, when Jeff, his, his amazing camera guy and his team is awesome. They let me fill in one week, um, in Phoenix for, for a fight camp, um, worked with Misha for her, uh, comeback fight and did that camp and that fight week, which was, which was cool. Um, and then, yeah, I, again, I've been in the action sports space. Uh, I worked with throw one, which ironically enough, just did a deal with the UFC, I believe. Um, and that was like SLS, which is a, a skateboarding company, um, nitro circus, which I, I think people know. Um, and then uh, nitro rally cross, which is like their, their, um, I guess car race. It's like, you know, have you heard of rally cross? Do you know what it is? I, I'm yeah. familiar with it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So they they do like their own version, Nitro Rally Cross in the US. Um, and then just recently started working uh in like the fine jewelry and, and watch space. Um, got a couple clients and brands that we're talking to to shoot some of the stores and and do some of the content uh and socials for them as well. So it's kind of just evolved into this this you know content uh thing that we're working on now. And um yeah, it's been it's been uh, definitely outside of my comfort zone for some of these things, but that's when you achieve the most growth, right? Yeah. So you're spreading your wings. I love it. Mm-hmm. What's what's it been like to go from working for a company, right, where that monthly paycheck's coming in, 
mm-hmm. to being an entrepreneur and being your own business because I've gone through that over the last four or five years and yeah. it can be challenging. Uh, it's, you know, it's not easy. Uh, but like you said, it does give you a lot of professional and personal growth. So what has that meant to you? And where do you think you are right now with the business? And where do you think perhaps the ceiling is? Yeah. So your first question, um, you know, it's challenging. Everybody, the one thing I hate about you know, the, the, the entrepreneur thing and like running your own business is like, I feel like most of the time you can't talk about it without sounding like you're talking down on like someone who works a nine to five or someone who works an everyday job. And, you know, I think that that's totally fine to do that, to, to, to work in an office job and, and work for a, a major corporation or, or even work at Trader Joe's. Like it's, it's your business, do what you want to do. Um, for me, again, it was kind of just a spur of the moment type idea that I wanted to see where it went. You know, I, again, like I was lucky enough to have a, a pretty decent resume at the time. So I was like, listen, if, I, if this fails, I can always go back into the corporate world if I want to. And so, um, you know, what I found was it's really challenging. It's really hard. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you have to think about and figure out when you're employing people or paying contractors or, you know, um, trying to say yes to a number of things and maybe not having the bandwidth. So, uh, you know, organizational skills have to be off the charge, which, which mine are not, uh, and, and it's a work in progress all the time, but, um, you know, it's just, it's just challenging. That's the best word for it is challenging. On the other hand, though, it's very rewarding to, to do something and put a lot of effort into something and see it pay off and be like, that was us. Like we, you know, we did that. And again, I, we're not like uh, super active in the media. There's not a lot of like things going out about the things that we've done, but when you see the athletes or the clients kind of appreciate what, what we do, and then it gets picked up in uh, various other places, that's, what's rewarding about it. Cause it's at the end of the day, all your success is on you guys and all of your failure is on you guys. And I can live with that. I, I want that type of pressure, you know, because if you can't, uh, if you're not successful, you fail, you learn from those, you pick it up, you move on to the next one. So, uh, and then as far as where the business is now, where I see it going, um, you know, we're, we're talking to a, a number of different people, um, who could use kind of a content branch or service. Um, and you know, the, the ultimate goal with this, when I started, it was kind of to just ride the wave and see where it goes. And then, you know, eventually, hopefully maybe merge with someone or get acquired or or do something in that regard. This has always been just kind of like a fun project that I happened to monetize. You know, that that was that was kind of what it was. It was never kind of let me be the biggest media conglomerate in the world or, or the biggest social this in the world. It was how do I help athletes own content, own their IP? Uh, and then when, when I when I do that or when I figure that part out, how do we kind of you know, collaborate with other people or agencies or, or, or companies that are doing something similar and make make it a real big uh, success. So I think that's that's where I kind of see the business going from here. Love it. I'd love to share a little story with you and see if this is something that's uh, quite common, uh, especially in your line of work. So mm-hmm. not too long ago, there was a ranked UFC fighter who was starting to produce a lot of great content. And from the outside looking in, I could already see, oh, there's a, a whole bunch of things you could be doing right now to optimize it, to make it efficient, to make it better for the various platforms. And he just put something out like on Instagram to say, hey, I need help with this. I need help with that. And I kind of just DM'd him and I said, hey, listen, I'm happy to give you an hour of my time. Let's jump on a Zoom call and I'll you know, give you some tips and advice. I jump on a call with him and lo and behold, his, his management company were not helping him, his agent. I'm not going to name anyone here, but his agency was not helping him or were not able to help him. Um, No one in the promotion was able to help him, even though he asked. I gave him some tips, some advice. A week later, instant impact. And the content's performing better. It's now monetized. He's doing better. And also, he has learned to be able to, he's learned some new skills in between, obviously, fights and being injured and, you know, going through camp and killing some more time. And that's correlating to something else which is I get hit up all the time from people asking how they can break into the industry. What are the opportunities? And when I wanted to get into the industry, I was looking at the MMA media route and it was the the journalism route. But this is going back, you know, 11, 12, 13 years. Today, in 2023, I would be saying go the social route. 
go the content creation route because there are so many fighters, so many athletes that A, need the help and B, if you can strike a relationship with them, then mm-hmm. perhaps you can, you know, be working with the next Francis Ngannou or working mm-hmm. with the next Kamaru Usman or the next, you know, Misha Tate or what have you, or, you know, mm-hmm. start to kind of build skills that may lead you to, towards a path of working for a promotion or a brand. I'm curious, just sharing that little bit of a story with you. Is that quite common when you've had so many fighters speak to you, asking for help with this, asking for help with that? And also with regards to opportunities in the business for new graduates or fight fans just want to get involved in the fight game? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. So I I actually speak at UNLV, the the university here in Vegas, every semester uh, to the business school. And sometimes to the they have like a social media class, like a a digital marketing, you know, whatever class. Um, And I tell them basically what what you just said, like, A, I tell them my my DMs are always open, right? If if anybody is ever interested in this kind of route and figuring out, you know, how to break into it, my DMs are always open. But number two, yeah, social media has become, you know, the main form of communication for a lot, for everyone. You know, when, when we were coming up, you had to go physically into a gym, right? Or physically into uh hang out outside the hotel or whatever the case may be or call them up in the yellow pages whatever you know whatever the case may be um and now you have a direct line of communication to you know whomever you'd want to potentially work with and there are ways to go about that obviously right like you you know there's a professional way to go about it but yes all of communication is 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 now done through these social platforms and so you know, gone are the days where you have to kind of try to track and hunt people down. You can literally send DM your portfolio or some of your work and just say, Hey, I would love to work with you and help you and figure out the business. end when you figure it out, but if you're really truly trying to just help and build someone's profile and page, um, that's what you should focus on first. And then all the other stuff will, will, will figure itself out. But yeah, I mean, these guys, all of these guys and girls in MMA, particularly, most athletes in general, but MMA particularly need to, you know, begin thinking as a business man or woman and not an athlete. You know, Markel and I were just talking about the other day, like these athletes got to stop thinking about, got to stop thinking like athletes and start thinking like businessmen and women, uh, because that's what this is. And, you know, obviously MMA is well-documented with all the, the, you know, stuff that goes on there and the, and the, and the things that aren't right with the sport. Um, but at the end of the day, they can do something to help themselves. And that starts with their content and owning their own content and their IP. And, you know, as you said, the promotion they were in, whatever that was, didn't really want to help them or lend a hand. And that's for, you know, that's for a reason, right? Like, let's not be naive. That That's for a reason. So, um, yeah. I'd love to get your take on the correlation between social media and mental health. This is something that mm. I, I feel like is a work in progress for me. And I feel like there are times throughout the year where I'm doing a better job uh, than other times. Uh, But it's something that I feel like a lot of people, especially younger people that are growing up with social media, like I grew up with, you know, a phone where all you could do is make a phone call and text. (laughs) So I literally have, yeah, like, and play snake, (laughs) right, exactly. Whereas kids now are literally growing up with everything in their face from tablets to phones. Um, And I would just love to kind of get your take on how you personally um, deal with, with uh, managing your mental health when it comes to social media and if there's any advice you would give to anyone that is unable to cope at the moment as looking for some guidance there yeah that's a that's a deep question um you, you know i always say i say this all the time about social it has done social media the introduction of social media and digital media in this world and the internet in general has done far more good than it has bad for the for us as a as a as a people right? For the world, in my opinion. But the bad is just so bad. It's hard to overlook, right? It's hard to, you know, think about the good and how much it outweighs the bad because it's just right there in your face. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, having breaks and people say this all the time, but it's so true. Like having breaks, being able to put the phone down, setting your, your screen time to a certain amount, all those things are very important. And, you know, it, at the end of the day with how power my career is based off social media, but it's not real life, right? It's just not, you, you, you can be whoever you want to be. You can say whatever you want to say. You can, you can look and talk however you want, but at the end of the day, it's not real life. What matters is like you said, your mental health, your relationship with yourself, your relationship with your 
partner, your family, those things. So I think putting the phone down and, and setting, you know, a certain amount of screen time um, is easier said than done, but I think it's a necessity. Right. And I think it's good. And, and I'm guilty of this myself. I am, I don't do anything I'm saying right now. And I don't say that to be funny or anything. It's just the truth. My job isn't social, but I could definitely be better about putting it down and not getting on Twitter or Instagram or, or TikTok or snap or whatever. Um, and, you know, saying from 7 PM till the next morning, I'm not touching my, you know, social media. Um, and so again, I know it's easier said than done, but it is something that's important for me. You know, the biggest thing f- that I face, um, from a, I guess, a me- I guess this would be a mental health standpoint. And I think it is, is imposter syndrome. I am, you know, I still right now at this very moment, don't think I know about social and digital media. Like I, I just have this thing where, you know, I'm like, okay, maybe that was kind of cool, but like, I bet people are out there doing it 10 times better. Right. Or you see another agency or another person that takes a better photo than you, or runs a, a, a business or has a business idea that you wish you had, or someone that edits video better than you, or maybe it looks more cinematic than yours. Um, I do that stuff all the time and, and it's not good. It's not healthy. Um, you know, th- at the end of the day, you're, you're putting something out there for the world to judge. And if it, if it works great, if it doesn't work great, but everyone else is just trying to do the same thing. So it's like, you know, you have to kind of take a step back and understand what you're doing is good. It work. It, it works. It's, it's fine. Just the way it is. If you want to make tweaks to it, make tweaks to it. But uh, you know, that quote comparison is the thief of joy. Right. And like, you know, imposter syndrome is is just that it's comparing right at at its core. And so that's how I struggle with it. I try not to, I try to, you know, get, get away from anyone else who's doing anything. Not that I don't like it. I just, the way my mind receives it is not the best. And so, um, I battle that all the time, but, um, but again, it's, it's just, it, 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 there's a, there's a, there's a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a way to go about it. And I think that starts with kind of separating yourself from it for a little bit and, you know, taking a step back, taking a breather, and then reintroducing yourself to it when you feel you've had a, a good enough break. But yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. It causes a lot of issues. I'm not saying it doesn't, but you know, there are certain ways to go about handling it. I know it's a deep question, but I really appreciate the response because I feel like, especially people like us that work in social media, the more we can share knowledge, if it can impact someone that's listening or watching, then God bless. Yeah. Uh, we are going to end on a, on a light, positive note. Um, okay. So I like to end all my conversations and all, and all my interviews or something I like to call the bit for social. And it's different every time with the, with the guests that I'm speaking to. So for you, Randy, what I like to do is I'd like to get your favorite social media platform for the following Mm -hmm. starting off with engaging with the mma community twitter mma memes instagram or twitter but but instagram monetization snapchat vertical video content TikTok. The fastest audience growth. Mm, probably TikTok. Yeah. Even though and, I've I've seen a lot of success on Instagram, even still, TikTok is just, you know, it, the growth has been insane. And finally, if you could only keep one social media platform on your phone, what would it be? Twitter. 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 Twitter is the great <laughs> Twitter is the greatest place. It, it, it can be the worst place, but it's also just I mean, the the memes from like a, a live golf PGA announcement the other day or Messi coming to Miami or any big UFC event, uh, you know, for better or worse, but I mean, NBA Twitter, I mean, it's just Twitter's the best, man. I I I just I love Twitter. It would be Twitter. 100%. I agree. Me too. Me too. Randy, mm-hmm. this has been great, man. Um, like I said, yeah. like I, I get fighters and big notable names in the sport on my show all the time, but I really want to try and speak to some people that I feel like 
need a spotlight, don't do interviews or, or you know, perhaps don't have the opportunity to do interviews because I feel like the industry is always progressing, always evolving. And there are people that work behind the scenes that play an important role. You've done it at the UFC. You're doing it now with 333. God bless the relationship with Francis Ngannou and where you can take things, especially now in such an important time for him in his career, as well as all the various clients that you have both within the fight game and beyond. I really appreciate it, man. I just want to say two things real quick. Number one, thank you. Um, We've known each other for for a long time. I think what you've done in this space is amazing from the media side, in the social space. You're super diverse. You know, you're able to touch a lot of different areas within uh, combat and sports in general. And so I just want to say, keep doing your thing. Uh, I love your content. You know, I really enjoy you as a person. Uh, And so thank you very much for having me on. And I just want to say this one little things we didn't talk about pfl or anything like that which is totally fine but i just want to give a shout out to markel martin who you know has for lack of a better term eaten his fair fair um amount over the last couple years and um you know he is one of the the smartest most genuine people i've ever met everything we've ever talked about has come to fruition and not just now, but even in the future of things that, 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 you know, we're all working on. So I just wanted to give you a, give a quick shout out to him. Uh, we didn't get to talk about him or the PFL deal or anything like that, which is totally fine, but just wanted to make that very clear uh, because he's been instrumental in, in helping me with my career and building 333 and making that connection with Francis. And so I just wanted to give him his flowers as well and you, your flowers as well. So I appreciate awesome. it. A, I appreciate all the kind words and absolutely shout out to Markel. I'm going to be having him on my show and my podcast talk about a whole bunch of things as well. So there's a little teaser Great. for what's to come uh, in the series. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I, I see what you, Markel and Francis have, have built together and it's a beautiful thing. It's fantastic. Um, and hopefully we see more of this as yeah. the, the the sport kind of continues to grow and evolve. Uh, but yeah, awesome. Randy, like I said, all the best. Congratulations on the business. And I hope it continues to do very, very well. And hopefully I'll see you on site at some event at some point down the road, man. Yes, absolutely. We'll be in touch. Thank you very much, man. Take care, Randy. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. It really means a lot to me. And hey, listen, if you enjoyed this episode, please go and give it a follow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows.